Well, hello everyone, my name is Kyle. I wanna welcome you to Uplift and the conversation if you're joining us on Sunday mornings, we're in a series called Pray Like This. Pray Like This. And it's from Matthew chapter six where Jesus teaches on prayer and what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. This is, this is what he says in Matthew chapter six, verse seven. And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. I've said this through previous messages, and I'll reiterate it again here. Jesus is simply saying, you don't have to pray with embellishments. You don't have to use fancy words. Nobody to impress. It's okay to use simple words and simple phrases to speak from your soul. In other words, Jesus says, pray like this. And so from there, Jesus teaches his disciples what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer. We talked about this prayer last week. So as is our custom, I want, to, I want us to read this together out loud. Let me hear you beginning in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6. Let me hear you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into testing, but deliver us from evil. And if you read it from the King James Version, it concludes this way. Let me hear you. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a simple prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus taught, but it comes from a place, and I've said this already, that betrays our own desperation for God. This message is called The Door of Heaven, and it's going to continue in Jesus' teaching on prayer a little bit later from Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin by reading the text. This is what Jesus says just a few verses later. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who, who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it'll be opened. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus continues to teach on prayer, following his disciples' request to learn from him. Now, we've discussed Jesus' teaching on prayer and how he talks about praying in secret. In other words, you close yourself off from the world. You close yourself off from noise. Turn your phone off. You talk only to the Lord. You close yourself off from the judgments of others, from the ears of other people. He taught this in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. That is, that is the how. It's kind of what it looks like when you pray. But what, what Jesus does here in Matthew chapter 7 is he moves into a more foundational aspect of prayer that resonates. It actually resonates through Scripture. Jesus continues a theme that's apparent, and it's this, the unwavering assurance that our prayers are not only heard, but they are also answered. Hmm. I want you to note the rhythm of assurance with which Jesus delivers this pledge. You will receive, you will find, it will be open to you. Pretty phenomenal. Jesus strengthens this concept by firmly anchoring it in the foundational tenets of the kingdom from just a few statements earlier in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. So here in our text from Matthew 7, he used the same word for seek. Those who ask, receive, and those who seek, find, and to those who knock, doors will be opened. This, open. this seeking, it cannot be disentangled from the pursuit of the kingdom. So with some unwavering clarity, Jesus echoes these affirmations six times over, underscoring the profound truth that our prayers hold weight. They hold weight. Grasping the Father's love is, is pivotal but it's intertwined with this cru crucial lesson in the journey of prayer. And it's this, that everyone 
who asks receives. Everyone who asks receives. So through this, through this particular part of Jesus' teaching on prayer, there are three distinct principles. They're on your order of worship. You can fill them in. They'll be on the screen. Here's the first. Prayer. Prayer is an invitation. It's an invitation. I want us to look again and more deeply at Jesus' choice of these three words of ask and seek and knock. Those are big words. And the first of those words is ask. Now, when Jesus instructs us to ask, he's inviting us into a posture of humility and dependence. It's a recognition of our need for God's provision and guidance in every aspect of our life. In fact, asking is an act of surrender. It's an acknowledgement that we cannot navigate life alone. But listen, let's not mistake asking for a mere list of demands presented to this divine vending machine. Asking in prayer is an invitation to enter into a dialogue with God. That's what it is. It's to pour our hearts out to him, knowing that he hears us and he cares for us. In, in fact, asking God is a critical function in prayer. The letter of James reminds us that our lack of request, our lack of answers is tied to not asking. This, this, is, this, this is great significance in asking. Look at this. This is what James writes. You, you do not have because you do not ask. So in teaching this, Jesus implies that, that, our, uh, that, that in our posture of prayer before God, it, we can ask anything, but asking anything is bound up by the, our atonement, by Jesus' atonement that allows us the grace without prerequisite. There's freedom here. We are free to ask without doing anything first. And Jesus affords that to us. Jesus has paid it all. We have the freedom to ask. That's the first. Here's the second of these words that extends this invitation, the word seek. Seeking is the pursuit of intimacy. It implies a desire to know God more deeply, to explore the depths of his character and the riches of his love. It's not, though, the seeking of intellectual curiosity. It's not the seeking of religious duty to seek is to pursue God himself, assuring that we will indeed find him. But, but I want us to be clear. Mere discovery of this, of seeking God in, in times of crisis and need, it, it falls short. When, when we only seek God when we're in the depths of our troubles, we only seek God for the benefit of our requests. Now listen, that's not the wrong way to pray. If you are in trouble, you seek God. That is not a judgment, but it's not communion with God. It's not communion. Our pursuit must lead to an enduring communion with him. And here's the third word, knock. This, this, this is the prayer of yearning for our admission into the presence of God. It implies boldness and a refusal to be deterred by obstacle or delays. Knocking implies an awareness that the person on the other side of the door is home. That's what it means. We respect him enough to not barge in, but we're confident enough that he's going to open it. That he's going to open it. And prayer like this, this is an invitation. It's what moves us to the door of heaven. We see this progression in what is I think the second tenet of Jesus is teaching here, and it's this, that prayer is not just an invitation, it's a journey. Again, I want you to notice this progression. Asking and receiving leads to seeking and finding, which culminates in knocking and the opening of the door to the Father's embrace, but the journey is not aimless. It has one purpose, and it's this. The Lord desires us to possess unwavering confidence that our petitions and that our questions and our appeals will never be futile, ever. You can ask anything of God. Answered prayers, divine encounters, and the welcome embrace of God's heart 
are the assured rewards of our communion with him. We, we journey with prayer knowing that really the destination is the dialogue with God. It's not always what we want, but that is what we need. And that's where prayer leads us. Jesus' insistence on reiterating this truth in various forms carries profound weight. It reveals his intimate knowledge of who we are at our core, how doubt and skepticism toward God creep in and how easily we slip into viewing prayer as just a ritual rather than a gateway to real answers. Jesus understood that while we may believe intellectually in God as the listener of prayer, truly engaging in faith-filled prayer that fully grasps the promise is a spiritual pursuit. It's a journey. And look, it's a challenge for even the most earnest disciple. So really, from the outset of Jesus' teachings on prayer, he endeavors to etch this truth in our souls that prayer wields immense power. Again, ask, and it'll be given to you. Everyone who asks receives. This stands as an immutable eternal principle in the kingdom. And here's what I want us to do. I want you to persist in faith. I want you to stay the course. I want you to take this journey and let the word and the spirit guide you in praying rightly. And here's the third tenet, and we're going to spend a little more time on here. Prayer is an assurance. It's an assurance. Now, I want you to notice the clarity, the clarity of Jesus's words here. Again, everyone who asks, receives. He leaves no room for doubt here. Makes us a little antsy, makes us a little nervous. So we're going to talk about that. So what I want to challenge us right now before we keep going is I want us to, I want to challenge us to take Jesus at his word here. And I, and I don't want us to relinquish this assurance. And I don't want us to relinquish our confidence. It's important to kind of hold on to that over the next few minutes because this assurance is, is it's loaded with one serious temptation. And that temptation is this, to water down Jesus' words with our own understanding. That's a big one. We don't have to figure this out. We don't have to pull up any Greek words for this. Resisting this temptation to water Jesus' words down, to try to explain them away or move around them or maybe look at them in a different frame or put them in a different box and shake them. Resisting that temptation is really to embrace Jesus' words fully. It's to believe unreservedly. And the revelation of this truth is given to those who believe this. Because Jesus' words here, they highlight this dynamic interplay of human and divine elements. Now, from our perspective, we engage in the act of asking. That's what we do. But from God's perspective, he emanates the act of giving. That's what he does. We ask and receive. God hears and gives. Listen carefully. We never supply and God never asks. This is how the dialogue works. And prayer has a clear dichotomy of responsibilities, though. But the greater truth here, again, in resisting this temptation, is that Jesus' words implore us to not settle for silence from God. Now, that may sound a bit aggressive, but the truth of Jesus' teaching is that every earnest and trusting plea finds fulfillment. Now, for those of us who have labored in prayer for days or months or even years for some of us, sometimes our requests, this old school word of supplication, you remember that word? Sometimes our supplications are met with silence. At least that's what we perceive. It's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. And here's what I want to challenge us to do. I want us to do a couple of things. Again, let me reiterate this. Resist the temptation to passively surrender under the guise of resignation. 
to resist this idea that God is vetoing what we ask. I don't want us to do that. Instead, I want us to kind of flip that a little bit and do this. Scrutinize what we ask. And discern if there is any disharmony with God's will. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. If our prayers are met with silence, that's the first thing. Here's the second thing we do. Actively pursue the grace necessary to pray in a manner that's conducive to receiving answers. Yielding to the tendency to surrender without response is very easy to do. It's very simpler and it's easier than to submit to the rigorous examination and purification and sanctification by the Spirit, which is essential for nurturing unwavering faith in prayer. Stay away from the paths of least resistance in prayer. Look, it's disheartening. It hurts me to observe this sort of spiritual malaise where we seem resigned to a prayer experience that's devoid of tangible answers. When we, have, when we aren't given that which we ask, we immediately blame God because really that's what it's all about. It's all about what we want, God. So if you don't give it to us, it's your fault. We pray, we present, yet we often lack the palpable assurance of answered prayer. But I, I want us to remember this. We are assured an answer. We aren't assured an agreement. We're assured an answer. We're not assured an agreement. Prayer, prayer is this daily communion with God. It's this daily act of worship. The assurances taught by Jesus, they do... They do mean that we can approach God with specificity. But with the healthy agreement that our seeking must first be for the kingdom of God. That's what we ask for first. This is the umbrella by, under which we pray. Do our requests allow us to further seek the kingdom first and above all things? That's the question. It's often that the response to our petitions take the form of denials. It's not a judgment on you. It's not a judgment on us. Nor is it a way for God to suppress you or oppress you. God doesn't have it out for you. It means that seeking the kingdom first is and must be our top aim in communion with God. And listen, our answers are meant to move us in that direction. It's not meant for us to change our habits to secure an answer that we want. Listen, a refusal is not unusual. Let me give you a couple of examples. Talk about Moses for a minute. At the end of Moses' life, Moses pleaded with God to enter the promised land. That was his prayer. He had led the people of God from slavery in Egypt, from the Exodus, and in the wilderness, and he's standing and he's looking at the promised land and he wants to go into the promised land. He's pleading with God to let that happen. And God said, no, I'm not going to let you do that. God had a salvation history to orchestrate. In fact, in God's mind, God had this very message in mind when he told Moses, no. He knew that you needed to hear this. In, in, in God's economy, he has this salvation history to orchestrate, and Moses' part of that history had been completed. It was over. The story was not about Moses. It was about God's working. It wasn't about Moses' wanting. God's kingdom must be sought first above all things. And here's what I want to kind of present. Had Moses considered God's version of this plan, he might not have even asked to enter. And by the way, Moses didn't attempt any behavior modifications to change the mind of God. The beauty of this is that God clearly communicated with Moses and he clearly communicates with us why certain requests can't be granted. 
And to show you this, I told you we had two. Jesus is the other example of what happens when those requests are given. Listen to Jesus' prayer from Luke 22. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He's staring at his imminent death by crucifixion. And this is his prayer. If you're willing, Father, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus requested something. And then he withdrew that request when it would not be given by submitting to the will of God and seeking first God's kingdom. That's what Jesus did. Prayer is how God aligns us with his will. Both Moses and Jesus petitioned God to change his course. And both of those petitions were denied. God used their prayers and his answers to align both of them with his guidance, with his will, and the designs and intentions of his kingdom. God instructs those willing to heed his guidance through his word and his spirit, whether their petitions align with his intentions. And by the way, one of those was a continuation of suffering. Jesus would not just die, but would suffer over the course of the next few hours in awful ways. And God allowed that to happen because Jesus' suffering was couched under the kingdom of God. That's what prayer does. It, it allows us to align ourselves with the kingdom first. Prayer serves as the conduit for obtaining answers. And it's within this dynamic interplay of prayer and response that the bond of love between you and God is forged. The struggle to fully embrace these promises, though, I think it reveals the depth of our heart's detachment from God. We might not even want to hear this. It's easier to blame God than to say, sanctify me. While we may intellectually not acknowledge these words and believe their veracity, the journey to wholeheartedly embracing them with our faith, it unfolds gradually. And look, it's okay if it takes time to learn this. It's okay. We're fragile. And we're learning. And it is a journey. And, and often, we can't, our, our, in our limited capacity, we can't always fathom the mind of God. And we can't always see what God has in store for us later or for other people later. We, we don't understand that. But look, no one's going to teach us quite like Jesus. If we approach Jesus' teachings on this with simplicity and trust, and we allow his spirit to breathe life and power into, into us, then, then Jesus' words here, they're going to permeate our innermost being. We're going to pray differently tomorrow. Let me seek your kingdom first, Lord. The spiritual truth inherent in these words will grip us and they will compel us to persist until each prayer ascends to heaven on the wings of Jesus' own promise and straight to the door of heaven with these words, ask and it'll be given to you. Praise the Lord for that.